So I'd like to begin this presentation sermon with just a moment of prayer, if you'll join me first, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for this blessed Sabbath day. May we truly keep it holy in Jesus. Thank you for your plan of salvation. Thank you for this time of rest. And thank you for your message of healing. May it be expressed by your Holy Spirit, I pray, that we be inspired to follow your way. May we be baptized with the Holy Spirit as well. For this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I'm Dr. Jim Saeed, and I'm a naturopath and a chiropractor for years. I stopped counting a long time ago. I graduated medical school in 77, still in active practice. So I'm going to give you a brief summary of my testimony to lead into this subject, which is extremely dear to my heart. And thank you for inviting us here. So um, I was raised in a very strange environment. I'm going to skip the spiritual aspect and stay mainly with the health aspect. So I was raised in an environment of a typical Western American diet, sort of. My parents were Lebanese and Iraqi, so I was raised in Middle Eastern cuisine, but I was sick all the time. We ate meat, we ate eggs, we ate fish, we ate dairy, we ate cheese, we ate bread, we ate all the standard things that people eat, including a w root beer, Lord help us, and I was sick all the time as a child. My gut was a mess, earaches, tonsillitis, all the time. And so I thought, this does not work for me. I went to college, I went to Stanford pre-med, if you can figure that out. I wanted to be either an atomic physicist or a neurosurgeon. Where that came from, I don't know, but that was my aspiration. So at Stanford, I studied physics, but I fell in love with math, physics, and art, and I ended up as an engineer, and then went into bioengineering. Now, briefly, my last year at Stanford, I was involved in bioengineering research. We were doing the first robotics experiment on the knee. This is 1969, when it was. And I was sent to the morgue, to the medical school dissection lab, to do research on the knee for the work we were doing. I went back to the dorm one night, and what I had been working on looked exactly like what they fed us. That wasn't a pleasant thought. And I gave up meat. I thought, that's where that comes from. I have no interest. I lost total appetite for meat. Then I started studying about health. Not just medicine, but health. And I started studying it as an engineer. And I started studying the history of healing and the history of medicine globally and throughout history. And I made it a true study. And I found that medicine is not what we think it is today. This is a new version of medicine in the modern medicine era of pharmaceutical and interventive medicine. This is a new newcomer on the scene of health. But medicine dates back thousands of years that I could trace. And I was not an Adventist at the time. I became an Adventist later in life. I'll tell you that story later. And what I found was this is the system of medicine that we were producing here was not sustainable. Drugs was not a sustainable system from my perspective. So I started studying the natural hygiene movement. You ever heard of that system? It came out of Kellogg. You've heard of him? And no one ever mentioned Sister White. So I started studying that system and began to develop systems of understanding for me. And I was working with patients even when I was an engineer. Don't ask me how, but that's how it worked. And so I decided to go back to school instead of staying in engineering. I could go to any medical school I wanted in the world. This is just how it worked in the company I was with. I said, I don't want to go to medical school. I'm going to chiropractic college and naturopathic college to do the studies that I want to do to continue the research that I'm doing. So I did that back and graduated in 1977. I was introduced to Sister White in the year 2000. I'd been in practice for 23 years at that point, and I met an angel in Zurich, Switzerland. Now, early in my life, I was praying to the Lord to know God. I was not raised as a typical Christian. My mom was a 
Episcopalian nominally. My dad was Muslim, and my grandfather who lived with us was an atheist because he was a Roman Catholic beaten by enough priests as a kid that he became an atheist. And he used to take me in his room when I was a kid and read me these books on the corruption of the papacy. I thought, why are you telling me this? I found out later. I prayed to the Lord, Lord, I can't find you. I searched for him all my life. I couldn't find him. I was teaching in Zurich, Switzerland. The Lord flew an angel all the way across the Atlantic to meet me. She brought me to the Lord. She's now my wife. How many can say they married an angel? I can. She gave me two books to read when I first met her. One was called Ministry of Healing. The other was called Councils on Diets and Foods. I thought, this is intriguing. I read them both. I'm a voracious reader. I said, whoever wrote this was a prophet. Nobody knew this at that time. I said, Kellogg was the one that was accounted to bring this information forward, and I found out it wasn't Kellogg that got the information. It was from the Lord through a prophet. And that was my first introduction to Sister White in her work. And I've read a lot of her work since then. I'm writing three books right now on historical biblical prophecy. And I respect her work immensely. But in healing, she was absolutely right on. So I'm going to start with you in the Bible. So I want you to go with me first to Job chapter 7. Job chapter 7 and verse 17. We're going to build an understanding from Scripture first about who we are and what healing really means. Job chapter 7, amen when you're there, verse 17. What is man that thou shouldst magnify him, and that you should set thine heart upon him? Think about that. Who are we in the eyes of God? What is man that you, God, should magnify him? That you should set thine heart upon him. Now go to Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8. 8th Psalm, verse 4. Psalm 8, verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? God is mindful of each one of us. God sees us, knows us, creates us, lives his life in us if we permit. He wants his very mind to be ours. He wants his heart to be ours. He wants us to be healthy, perfectly healthy in Christ Jesus. This is God's desire for us. Now, go to Ephesians Chapter 1, verse 4. Ephesians, the first chapter, the fourth verse. After Galatians, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. This is God's yearning for us. This is not something apart from us. It's in us. It's who we are in Christ. He's chosen us in him, not apart from him, in him. What does that mean, in him? How more intimate can that be? In him, before the foundation of the world, before it was all created, we were in him. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We can't be holy and not be in Christ. Holiness is in Jesus. Our holiness is found only in Christ, in love, only in Christ. Now, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. These verses I'm sure you're well aware of. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 16. 1 Corinthians Third chapter, 16th verse. Paul has several verses like this. Know you not that you are what? The temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you. What is the temple? But a place where God dwells. You'll have to hear my wife lecture sometime on the sanctuary. It's brilliant. In fact, it's what brought me to the Lord. About the dwelling place of God. The temple of God 
is in us. We are the temple. He dwells in us. Can you fathom what that means? God, the infinite creator, dwells where? In us? That blows my mind. When I study the body, it can't be any other way. Have you ever studied the body, human anatomy? Anybody? Physiology, biochemistry, physics in the body, stoichiometry, all of it. When you study the body, God alone sustains this. God alone creates this. We're upheld by the right hand of his power, or the power of his right hand. Works, works both ways. I'm going to share something with you. When you smash an atom, what do you get? At Stanford, we had a linear accelerator. It was a mile long across the San Andreas Fault. I never did understand that. But that's where it was. And you put an, an unsuspecting atom at the end of that, and you smash it with subatomic particles, and you burst it apart. And you measure what comes off that thing. It comes off as subatomic particles. Then they smash those and smash those and smash those until there's no more particles left. What's left after there's no more particles? Any idea in quantum mechanics? Frequencies. Vibrations. Frequencies. When I was at Stanford studying this stuff, I was 18. I thought, this is God singing. I didn't know what else to call it. I never studied the Bible about it. But God's voice is constantly being spoken. He speaks everything into existence. In his word, what he speaks is true. God's word can only become exactly what it says. Let there be light, and there was nothing else but light. He spoke us. He spoke the world into existence. So as God speaks, he forms us, and he continually forms us. We're constantly upheld by his power. So those Frequencies become subatomic particles that become atoms, that become molecules, that become aggregates, that become macromolecules, that become structures in our body, <clears throat> excuse me, continually. Do you follow? You can't exist without the Word of God continually sustaining you. We're a temple of the living Lord. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter six, verses sixteen. Excuse me. First Corinthians chapter six, verses nineteen and twenty. I love the way Paul starts this. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is where, in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. I have to tell myself this often. I am not my own, for you are bought with a price. What's that price? the blood of Christ, amen, the full treasure of heaven poured out as Jesus for us, for me, for you, for the next person, the blood of Christ poured out for that, for us, for each one of us. We were bought with a price, therefore, therefore, because we're bought by the blood of Jesus, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are? God's. This body is whose? Is it mine? No. Is my spirit mine? No. Your body and your spirit, which are God's. Now, if my body is God's and my spirit is God's, what is my next step? You tell me. Pardon? I can't hear you. If these are God's, what's my role? To receive him. To allow him to do the work he wants in me. To yield my will to him. If I arrest my will in myself, what's the consequence? We know it too well. I'll do what I want, not what God wants. The Lord help me. My, my yearning is to yield my will to him. That his life has lived in me. That's his desire for me. Now, finally, in this version, let's go to Romans chapter 12. I love these two verses. Verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12. We're setting a stage here. Verses 1 and 2. Now, I love the way Paul starts this statement. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, this is Paul's plea for us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, stop. Is he asking a lot? Yes or no? Yes. yes. A living sacrifice. Was Jesus a living sacrifice? Continually. His life was self-sacrificing, self-denying, and selfless. As he lives his life through us, we become self-sacrificing, self-denying, and selfless. Are we? This is our desire. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, that's only in Jesus, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Is it unreasonable? No, it's reasonable. Can it be done? Yes, it's reasonable. And be not conformed to this world. That's a key. What is the definition of pure religion? Caring for the widow and the orphan and remaining unspotted from the world. Be ye not conformed to this world, but ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now I'm going to come back to this quote from Alan White's writings in just a moment. The renewing of our mind. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Let every thought be brought into the captivity of the obedience of Jesus. Amen. This is what the Bible says will happen. He spoke it. It's done. Do we receive it? That's the key. Now, I want to read you a few quotes from Sister White. And this, these quotes are just amazing to me. She says, The laws of nature are the laws of God. Wow. The laws of nature are the laws of God, as truly divine as are the precepts of the Decalogue. Are the Ten Commandments divinely given? When we live them, is our life in Christ? It's all the only way we can do them to live them. The laws of nature are as divine as the Ten Commandments. Let that sink in for a moment. The laws that govern your, our physical organism, God has written upon every nerve, muscle, and fiber of the body. That's a lot of tablets. Every careless or willful violation of these laws is a sin against our Creator. Now, every day I'm in practice, I see this issue emerging. Every person that comes to me has a need. They're driven by two drivers. You know what they are? Fear and pain. You ever been in fear or pain and need to see a physician? Amen. Those are the drivers. I yearn to see someone who's driven by the motivation of love. And I see that on a rare occasion, by the way. I'm here because I want to get better. I'm not hurting. I'm not in pain. I'm not fearing for my life or from pathology. I just want to improve. I heard you can help me get better. I said, praise God. I don't care if they're Christian or not. I'll say, praise God. I always pray for a way in to show them God, that they can receive the love of Christ. She says, the power of the will, that's a yield to the Lord, the power of the will and the importance of self-control, both in the preservation and the recovery of health, the depressing and even ruinous effects of anger, discontent, selfishness, or impurity. You ever been angry? Don't have to raise your hand. You know, that's murder, right? Discontent, you don't care what the Lord's provided. Selfishness, all about you, never about the other person or the Lord. Or impurity. Are you the bride of Christ? You know what the bride does in the Jewish economy preparing to be for the wedding? Two things. She learns everything she can about her husband. Everything we can about our husband is right here. And in the spirit. Second, she, that seventh thing she does she purifies herself to be ready for the marriage. 
That's our job, brothers and sisters. The bride of Christ, we're to learn everything we can about our husband, Jesus, and purify ourselves. Truly, amen. This is, on the other hand, the marvelous life-giving power to be found in cheerfulness, unselfishness, gratitude, should also be shown. Now, have you ever heard of heart math? Anybody? Okay. Heart math is a system of research that was done on the heart. And they were measuring what's called heart rate variability, which is the resting phase of the heart. The heart's going lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Well, the time between the lub and the dub and the lub and the dub is a, is a resting phase. So heart rate variability measures the resting phase of the heart. What they found was one sensation, one feeling, keeps that perfectly regular and then trains the heart to the brain so that we now have a healing system throughout the body. I skip, I'm skipping a lot, but that's the concept. You know what that one sense is? Gratitude. More than anything else we can experience, gratitude and trains the heart and the brain to a regular healing rhythm. So when you're feeling yuck, you know what that means. That's a technical word. When you're feeling yuck, stop and pray. And remember what it is worth being grateful about. Jesus and the gifts he had given you, the blessings he's given, he's put in your life. Do you know how richly blessed we are in this culture currently? Don't take it for granted. Are you breathing? Are you above ground? Praise God. All right. Are you a sentient human being able to contemplate upon the Lord and pray? Praise God. Can you show the love of God to another person? If you experience it yourself, yes. That's healing. I love this now. Now we're going to get serious. Some have asked me, why should we have sanitariums? Why should we not, like Christ, pray for the sick that they may be healed miraculously? You ever wonder that? I have answered. Suppose we were able to do this in all cases. How many would appreciate the healing? Oh. Would those who are healed become health reformers or continue to be health destroyers? Would it markedly change their life? Would they now be a minister of the gospel? Or the minister of the true gospel? Or would they be a minister of the false gospel? A gospel of disease, so to speak. She says, Jesus Christ is the great healer, but he desires that by living in conformity with his laws, get this now, we may cooperate with him. This is what I tell every one of my patients. Say, I'm in the business of helping you cooperate with God. That's it. So he can do the work of healing in you all to his honor and his glory. That's my prayer for, every, prayer for and with every single patient. All to God's honor and God's glory. Only by your cooperation can that occur. You can block it. That's how powerful we are. Our doubt can block the will of God for us individually. Do we want to do that? No. Emphatically, no. So he asks us to cooperate with him. We're going to talk about how we can cooperate with him in a moment. Would you like to know that? You probably already do, but I'm going to remind you if you may have had a lapse in memory. He wants us to cooperate with him in the recovery and maintenance of health. There must be an imparting of knowledge of how to resist temptations. Whoa. Go with me, please, to James chapter 4, in case you forgot. I'm always bear reminding. I know I do. James chapter 4, verse 7. Book of James, chapter 4, and verse 7. Regarding temptations, he says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to whom? To God. Then he says, the next point, resist who? Resist the devil. And then he will flee from you. Amen. Our first task is to do what? Submit to the Lord. So, to resist temptations, first submit yourself unto the Lord. 
then resist the devil, then he will flee. Temptation will be gone. Have you ever been tempted to do something you know you shouldn't do? We're all card-carrying members. Okay? Lifelong. No one's immune. No one's immune. I speak from empathy. <laughs> I call trials in my life empathy trainers. They help me understand another person's plight. So, resist temptation. Does it take effort? If you want to heave that, eat that candy bar at the end of your dinner, is that a temptation? Will it harm you? Yes, that bowl of ice cream. I tell my patients, you cannot do worse than beer or ice cream. Sugar, sugar with dairy, the Lord help you also, okay? You will cause inflammation, you will degrade the body, you will experience a downside to it. Don't go there. How do I stop? Uh, knowledge. I teach my patients every single day of my career. I'm going to be going, we're going to go through some of that with you. She says, those who come to our sanitariums should be aroused to a sense of their own responsibility to work in harmony with the God of truth. Catch that? We have a responsibility. Now, she tells us how. These laws are basic. Pure air. Do we need air? Not the air you can see, by the way. But pure air, sunlight, not that's been obliterated by global dimming and particulates in the atmosphere that have been damaging the sunlight to this earth. Abstemiousness, what does that mean? It means just say no. <laughs> Self-control. It's important to take in what you need and it's important to not take in what you don't. Talk about both. Rest. Do we get enough? Exercise. Do we do that at all? It's essential for life. Life is movement. The body is designed to move. Proper diet. That's huge. The two things I see in my practice most commonly not done, guess what they are? Exercise and proper diet. Thank you. The use of water required for the body and trust in divine power. Yielding yourselves to the Lord moment by moment by moment throughout the day. She says, these are the true remedies. Every person should have a knowledge of nature's remedial agencies and how to apply them. It is essential both to understand the principles involved in the treatment of the sick and to have a practical training that will enable one rightly to use this knowledge. So we're going to talk about some of that today. Now, how many are sick or have been sick in your life? How many want to get well now? How many are willing to take a drug to get well now? <laughs> no one will arrest you. Nothing will happen. <laughs> it's a common phenomenon. I want to get well now, but I want not, I'm not, I'm not going to willing to take the time to do that. Give me something, doc, so I can be better now. You ever had that experience? We all have. Here's the problem. Drugs do not heal. Drugs do not heal. Drugs mitigate symptoms. But the, but the system of drug production is based on a business model to continue selling the drug. Now, my license in naturopathic medicine has me study both the drug world and the naturopathic botanical medicine nutritional diet world. I've studied both. I prescribe both. Prescribe drugs when I help my patients come off of drugs. We have to start changing dosing. So I have to do that at times. But I help many people come off of their pharmaceutical medications and toward a system of healing. Here's what Sister White says, and I love this statement. In fact, when I read this, I knew she was a prophet. Nature's process of healing and upbuilding is gradual. What's the word? Gradual. And to the impatient, it seems slow. Has gradual ever seemed slow? 
the surrender of hurtful indulgences requires sacrifice. That's how we yield our bodies. But in the end, it will be found that nature, untrammeled, does her work wisely and well. Don't get in her way. That's God. Don't get in God's way. Those who persevere in obedience to her laws will reap the reward in health of body and health of mind. It takes time. <clears throat> I tell my patients, if you want something to happen right away, I'm not the doctor to see. But if you want to heal and improve your life over time, we can get work, get to work on this. It's far better to prevent disease than to know how to treat it when contracted. And so prevention is worth a pound of cure. Amen. All right, now let's go here. This is Sister White. Those who will gratify their appetite, we've had that as an issue, we all have, and then suffer because of their intemperance and take drugs to relieve them may be assured, you ready for this? That God will not interpose to save health and life, which is so recklessly periled. The cause has reduced the effect. Those are very, very strong words. They're very sobering words. I respect that. But they're words of truth. Drugs don't heal. They only stop symptoms. Now, the body is what we call a nonlinear system. Point A to B doesn't work that way. It's A to a set of E to a set of C to a set of D. When you do a drug, it's from A to B to C to D linearly. But when you put a linear system into a nonlinear model or, or body, it doesn't work the way we think it will. So it generates what we call side effects. These are things that you don't want to have happen, and they won't in a linear model, but the body's not linear. Things are going to happen you can't expect. We call them side effects. We see this all the time. One thing that amazed me, I was watching a commercial one time, years and years ago, and they were selling some drug, and then they, how they go monotone with all the side effects. You know what one of the side effects was? Premature termination. What? Say what? Did anybody else hear that? You can die if you take this drug? I don't think so. They don't heal. If it wasn't so sad, it would be comical. All right, now let's take a look at what's going on here. Remember Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2? She says, only those who practice self-denial and self-sacrifice, living simple, healthful lives, will understand what constitutes the acceptable and perfect will of God. So there's a caveat to that. Only those who practice self-denial and self-sacrificing, self and self-sacrifice, living simple, healthful lives, then we can understand the acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, before I go to details now, when I work with patients and they start changing their diet, they change their lives, what happens inevitably is they start cleaning up their brain, they start reducing inflammation on the brain, they can start hearing the messages of heaven. Do you want to hear the messages of heaven? If the brain's inflamed, you can't. Did you catch that? If the brain is inflamed, you can't. How does the brain get inflamed? Through the gut. When we eat foods that are reactive in the body, that are pro-inflammatory, that trigger antigen reactivities, or antibody reactivities, they're antibodies that trigger antigens, those cross the blood-brain barrier and cause the brain to inflame. When the brain inflames, it inflames globally. It's called the microglial system. It's its own unique immune system in the brain. When it's triggered, it triggers brain-wide. And you can't think clearly. Have you ever had foggy mind, foggy brain experience, foggy headedness? You just can't think, or you get groggy after you eat. Common phenomenon. You're eating something that's triggering that to the brain. When a patient cleans up their diet, then they start to exercise and they start moving circulation through the body. The brain starts to reduce inflammation. Then they start hearing messages from heaven, and our conversation starts to change. 
They change us to understanding what their relationship is with God. I see this routinely. It amazes me. I couldn't begin to understand who God was in my life until I cleaned up my own life, my own diet. I was 22 when that started. Miserable beforehand, I changed my life in one weekend. I did what's called a dry fast. I don't recommend it. I ate and drank nothing for two days. Christ did that for how many days? 40 days. I did it for two. People thought I was going to die. I said, no, I'm not going to die. The second day, I felt like Vesuvius. My body erupted. Everything I didn't want mm, emerged. And I felt fantastic when that was over. And I got on track of eating properly for my body. I got rid of all flesh foods, animal, meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy, sugars, gone. I started changing my life. When that happened, my brain could start thinking about God in truth. I see this time and time and time again in practice. So let's look at some of these ideas. I want to look at one last verse with you. Psalm 139, verse 14. Psalm 139, verse 14. I love this verse. Psalm 139, verse 14. I know you know part of this verse. 139th Psalm, 14th verse. I will praise thee, for I am what? Fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, that my soul knoweth right well. That is one of the greatest understatements in the Bible. Fearfully and wonderfully made. I used to teach human dissection and gross anatomy. And what, first thing, one thing that amazes me is every square millimeter of your body has a name. There's things everywhere. Muscles, fibers of all kinds, connective tissue, nerves, vascular system, organs of all kinds. Held together by an incredible fascial system attached from bone to the skin. Everything's connected to everything. It is one body, one system. We study it like it's separate systems. You go to a urologist, you go to a gastroenterologist, you go to a neurologist, you go to a fetus, you go to another specialist of different kinds, as if we're separate parts of the body. No, we are not. Many, many, many patients come in because they have been to all these specialists and no one's connecting it all together. It's one body in the Lord, fearfully and wonderfully made, as one whole system. You can't separate them out. There's one field called psychoneurogastroimmuno, etc., ology. It puts them all together. And still, it's not all of them. They're all intimately connected. You can't separate them, praise God. So let's start looking about how we deal with this. I'm going to start with food. Um, you'll thank me later. We all eat, correct? Several times a day, typically. So we're changing the body daily, continually. And what you put in determines what you experience. Now, let's start with the gut. I see this all the time. Many patients come saying, my, bo my body's not working well, I've got a gut ache, tummy ache, some kind. You ever had that experience? You don't have to raise your hand, it's okay. Those people recover quickly. Here's the good news. The cells of your gut, your GI tract, replace themselves every three days. So it doesn't take long to heal the gut, by the way. But it does take attention to heal the gut properly. Now, what we eat determines the microbiome of the gut. You've heard of the microbiome? It's the gut flora. The gut flora has several thousand possibilities, but it only chooses 160 to 170 strains at a time. You know what they're dependent upon? What you eat. Because the food determines what bacteria grow in the gut and which ones don't. Some are pathogenic, some are healthful. If you eat a healthful diet, 
Guess what you create? A healthy living microbiome in the gut. If you eat garbage, guess what you create? A pathologic microbiome. Now, where was Adam and Eve created? Where were they created? In the garden. What food were they given to eat? Food from the garden. You know, in Genesis chapter 1. God told us right away how to do this. We're at the end of time, yes? We are asked to become healthy again according to an Edenic diet. Sister White made that very clear. They did not eat flesh foods. They planted seeds in the garden that came up something edible. You ever tried to plant a chicken? <laughs> not going to happen. If you take a plant of a seed of something that's edible, it will grow. We eat that food. That's what we're designed to eat. When we eat of the garden, the body can start to heal. Now the garden does not have, it's not dripping with oil or fats, and it's not dripping with sugar. You ever noticed? You ever planted a sugar bush? <laughs> if you find one, let me know. A fat bush? No. Nothing in the garden drips oils or fats. Nothing in the garden is saturated with sugar. Even if, you grow, if, even if you grow stevia, it has sweetness, but it's not saturated with sugar. So we're eat, designed to eat out of the garden. If we eat out of the garden, what does that include? Grains. Now, this is a, a subject that is already controversial. Here's why. You've heard the term gluten? Okay. I test my patients for food reactivities. Many, many, many patients test positive for gluten reactivity. There's groups, there's five different groups of immunoglobulins in the body, G, A, M, E, and D. Patients are reactive in one of those commonly to gluten. Or we see, we measure what goes on in the gut, through zonulin and the gluten in the gut, that is triggered by gluten commonly to create what's called a leaky gut. You ever heard that term? So the gut cells are tied together by tight junctions that allows the gut to properly function. So that we take in nutrients, they digest in the gut. It's a war zone in there, by the way, of enzymes to break things down. Have you ever tried to get an apple stuffed into a cell? You can't. The Lord figured out how to do that. Incredible. First of all, you start by doing what? Salivating. The brain starts digestion. You look at something that looks really good, and you start to salivate. Now you're ready to eat. Brain, the brain begins digestion. Then you salivate, you, you chew, you grind. That's why we're herbivores, by the way. Omnivores don't chew. What do they do? They tear, rip, and gulp. Okay? They don't stop and taste the food and enjoy it. They gulp. They have a short gut tube to get rid of it fast because it's going to putrefy and rot. And they don't want to get sick. But that's not us. We are herbivores. We're designed to grind and chew with molars. Hopefully you still have them. If not, get them put in. Because you have to grind. When you do, you break things down, you mix it up with the saliva, with enzymes in the saliva, and fluid in the saliva to swallow. Make sure you can swallow it. Liquid, not whole. It goes into the stomach. It starts digesting further with acids. It does a lot more than that, but I'll keep it simple. It goes into the small intestines and the duodenum. Now there it becomes filled with all kinds of additional enzymes from the pancreas and baking soda, if you will, sodium bicarbonate, from the pancreas to, to alkalinize what comes acid out of the stomach. Then it goes through the rest of the small intestines. And to be assimilated across the gut wall requires that the junctions of the, of the gut cells are tightly knit together. If they're not, then you don't let in large molecules. And you, excuse me. You let in large molecules you shouldn't let in. So if food is un un partially digested or not completely digested, the body sees it as a foreign protein and attacks it to get rid of it. So if you don't complete digestion, all these molecules are still stuck together. They shouldn't be. And the body says, that's a foreign protein. We need to get rid of it. It's a bug. It's like a bacterium or a virus. And it attacks it. What happens then? That attacking conglomerate goes to the rest of the body and looks for the same protein elsewhere in the body. And if it finds it, it attacks it in the body. That's called? an autoimmune condition. The body attacks itself. It starts with what you eat. 
you can't finish digesting the food you ate. That undigested food, I mean completely digested food, is a string of molecules together, especially proteins, like gluten, for example. You can't break it down totally. The body attacks that structure. It then seeks other structures that look just like that to get rid of them. You know, one of the most common structures is it looks like undigested gluten. Well, certain structures in the thyroid. Have you heard of Hashimoto's disease? So it's an autoimmune thyroiditis of the, thi of the uh, thyroid gland. I see many, many patients with Hashimoto's all over the country, daily. They can't tolerate gluten or dairy or eggs or soy or sugar. If they eat those foods, it's going to trigger the immune system to attack itself further, and they can't get well. When they stop eating those foods, you take out all the pro-inflammatory triggers, you do things nutritionally to support the immune system, the thyroid can recover. This is common. I see many autoimmune conditions in the body. Sjogren's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, etc. There's many, there's over, there's a hundred autoimmune conditions that we know of. I had one patient who had a bone graft requirement in her jaw. She had it done three times, the body rejected it. It came to me and said, what's going on? I said, let's check. I did a test on her to see what autoimmune pattern she had. She had a reactivity to her own bone. Her immune system was attacking her own bone structure. She couldn't get a graft to be able to chew. We treated her, got her past that. She got the graft done successfully. She's fine. Did we use drugs? No. We found out what the cause was. Remember Al White says, reason from cause to effect. So you look for the cause. Why is it happening? So we test to know why is it happening. We found out why. We resolved the why, the what got taken care of. She could get a bone graft and have her jaw replaced and, and chew again. Was that a big deal for her? Big time. So, when we eat foods that damage the gut, those tight junctions between the gut cells open up. They allow undigested food particles to get through that ordinarily wouldn't get through. Do you know what they block? Small particles, like vitamins and minerals. So you become nutrient deficient, and you become reactive to foods you should never be able to tolerate. That's what happens with a leaky gut. Can it be healed? Yes. Eat from the garden. Sometimes we do more, but that's the, the basis of it. So all the other grains, generally, no problem at all. Beans, legumes, that's where you get your protein. In beans, leafy greens, and crucifix crucifix vegetables. You know what the crucifers are? Things like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, arugula, Brussels sprouts, bok choy, the things that have slight tang to them, sulfur. They're healing. Steam them. Don't try to eat them raw. Steam them. You get more protein out of it when you steam them. So leafy greens, crucifix vegetables, and beans. Cook your beans until they're soft. My wife is a vegan chef. We have a health retreat center in Idaho that we're finishing construction on next month. And my wife does all the vegan preparation. She's an incredible cook. I'm, I'm blessed. She cooks, I clean. I'm only, I have the better part of the deal. But she says, cook beans until they're soft and don't use salt until they're done. If you use salt, they can't get soft. So you want your beans soft. When they're soft, you can extract the protein much more efficiently. Now, vegetables of all kinds, non-starchy veggies, your um, starchy veggies, some tubers, things that grow below the ground, help yourself. Tons and tons of possibilities. Fruits of all kinds. The best fruits, by the way, are berries. Phenols in them are very high in antioxidant support. I strongly encourage those. Incidentally, when it comes to eating fruits or sugars, if you put sugars at the end of the meal, what happens? They stay in the stomach too long, and what happens when sugars stay in a hot environment too long? Pardon? Thank you. They ferment. When they ferment, they turn to gas and alcohol. You get bloated and drunk on your dessert. You ever had a big Thanksgiving dinner and they had a big pie afterwards, and you can't get off the chair, you're in a coma, in a coma. you're drunk, and you have gas, and you bloat? Common. Eat dessert first. 
Here's what I mean by that. There's a caveat. Fruits do best, those are your sugars, no more than a fistful palm down. Huh. Not palm up, palm down. What can you hold on to, not what can you stack? That's plenty of fruit at a meal for most people. Eat that first. You can put it with leafy greens if you want, like in salads or green smoothies, because it's going to go through the stomach quickly. Then you put the rest of your food after that. That's ideal. So fruits are fine. Now, if you have melons, um, eat melons and give it a 25-minute break. That's a lot of high sugar. Nuts and seeds, people think of those as proteins. Think of them more as fats. Nuts and seeds and avocados are your fats. We'll come to that in a moment further. Spices, help yourself. Sweeteners, a very charged subject. Who likes sweet? You ever tasted mother's milk? Is it sweet or sour? It's sweet. <laughs> we get hooked early on. <laughs> Ask any baby. It's, we're hooked early on. Mother's milk is sweet. Do you know what has the lowest protein of all mammalian milk? Every mammal has, they, they nurse their newborn with milk. You know what has the highest protein? Moose, blue whale, and rats. So you want high protein milk, you know where to go. Now the last I know that rat milk is not a high ticket item in most people's diet. It's not a growth industry. Mammalian milk, human, is the lowest protein. Cows are several times more protein than we need. The young of that mammal requires the higher protein levels and the hormones to grow fast. We grow the slowest of all mammals. Some say nine months in utero, nine months ex utero, 18 months to, to grow into a full form. We grow very slowly. We don't need high levels of protein. We don't need high levels of hormones that other animals require for fast growth to survive. So people tend to way overdo fats. I found about 60% of my, my patient population can't genetically metabolize fats. So they store them. Now the, the chemistry that moves fats from the liver to the cell and the cell to the liver are called lipoproteins. You've heard of LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, you've heard of those? What do they call LDL cholesterol? Some call it bad cholesterol. No cholesterol is bad. The Lord made it. It's a misnomer. It's a great cholesterol. You just don't want a lot of it. The, the problem with LDL cholesterol is if it oxidizes. That's the damaging part. You can have a high LDL but low oxidized LDL, you're fine. You can have a low LDL but high oxidized LDL, you're not fine. That's a test that's been measured in the last year and a half, two years. It's a new understanding in cardiology. So we measure oxidized LDL. But patients that can't metabolize fats end up with high LDLs. And if the diet is atrocious, atrocious, they end up with high oxidized LDL, leading to heart disease. Now, there's a book I'm going to clue you in on. It's called The Clot Thickens. The Clot Thickens by a, a Scottish um, physician, Malcolm Kendrick. I read it. It's fun. It's, fun, it's almost tongue-in-cheek the way it's written. But it's a very serious book on heart disease. The Clot Thickens. I highly encourage it. Anyone with heart issues, read that book. He disproved the cholesterol theory, which has been known for the last 150 years, by the way. But there's a trillion dollar industry that's on statins that's dedicated to stopping that research. But others are researching it anyway. The Clot Thickens describes all the research that's gone on the last 150 years, proving the thrombogenic theory of heart disease. Heart disease is generated from inflammation. Catch that? From inflammation. We're going to talk about what triggers inflammation here in just a moment. I'm going to start with sugars. The sugars that generally are tolerated are from stevia and monk fruit. They do best. Oils generally tolerated. There's some controversy now around seed oils, but oils you don't need a lot of ordinarily. If your LDLs go up, you need less. So I'm going to look now at what, talk, what triggers inflammation. Have you ever heard of arachidonic acid? Where do you find it? All your flesh foods. 
meat, fish, fowl, eggs, and dairy. Arachidonic acid is a linoleic acid. It triggers always inflammation. How often? Always, thank you. Inflammation. Do you want inflammation? No. Do you know that inflammation is behind every pathology, including cancer? Now, there's, there's two videos out that are documentaries that I really like. One is called Forks Over Knives. You ever heard of that one? The work of Colin Campbell and uh, uh, T. Colin Campbell and Caldwell B. Esselstyn, Jr. I know Dr. Esselstyn, he came and lectured out where we were in Southern Oregon. I studied his work. I met him. He's got published papers on the reversal of heart disease. We've done that system with many patients and proven its reversal. T. Colin Campbell did the same research on cancer. They both came up with the same understanding. You know what that was? A plant-based diet. Reversing cancer, reversing heart disease. We had many patients with cancer come to our retreats. We've seen cancers reverse. If they follow the laws that the Lord put in place. We've seen heart disease reverse. We've seen diabetes reverse. The other movie is called What the Health? You have to enunciate. What the Health? It's an excellent documentary on the relationship between diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and flesh foods. Flesh foods increase the rate of type 2 diabetes, and it can't recover. We have patients that come with type 2 diabetes. Within a week to 10 days, they're recovered. 100% raw vegan diet, plant-based 100%. So my wife has put these, by the way, uh, on the, in the foyer. These are brochures to our retreats. You can take a look at those. If you have questions, you can ask my wife. But we have lots of experience, 18 years of experience with this in retreats. I've been in practice, what, 40, I lose count, 46 years. I see this all the time in practice. This is not just book knowledge. This is where the rubber meets the road. We see it all the time in practice, in reality and truth. Now, refined carbs. Well, carbs get refined and broken down because they taste sweet. You know there are people who get PhDs in sugar science? You know what they're hired to do in the food industry? Determine how much sugar should go into food so it becomes addictive. That's what they're hired to do. Do you know that? We are the guinea pigs. They put sugar in foods we don't expect it to find in foods to make it addictive. That's why it's put there. So refined carbs are a big issue. Sugars of all kinds don't work. I have lists of them. Anything ending in os, fructose, sucrose, maltose, dextrose, galactose. Have you heard of these, these sugars? You know what they end up as? Comatose. It's a bad joke, but it works. Remember about os. Agave, cane sweeteners, corn sweeteners, white sugar, brown sugar, blue sugar, green sugar. I don't care what color it is. It's still refined. Raw sugar, processed honey, malts, molasses, rice syrup, sucanat. All these concentrated sweeteners are pro-inflammatory. White flour products. Now, I'm so glad to see you're having a bread baking class here on gluten-free, which is awesome. In fact, one of our sons started the fastest growing and now the quickest growing bread company in the country. It's gluten-free, sourdough, called Simple Needs out of North Carolina. It's just, and it's growing so fast because of people realizing they don't do well with gluten when they do well with sourdough. So white flour, white rice, polished rice, sticky rice, minute rice are sugars. Puffed grains, now this is controversial, but when you puff a grain, the sugar index goes up. And rice and corn are both high in fructose. So puffed rice and puffed corn, like popcorn and rice cakes, just realize that they tend to be higher in sugar. If you have them, just notice how you feel the next morning. And I know in Adventism, I didn't know this before I became an Adventist, but popcorn is an essential, I'm told. It's kind of like um, haystacks. I didn't know what those were until I came into Adventist church. They're really good. But popcorn tends to be a staple, but just notice how you feel the next morning. Are you sluggish or are you okay? So just keep in mind how you feel is the best test for how food does in your body. Alcohol, the most refined form of sugar. Just say no. Now, jams 
jellies, and fruit juices are metabolized in the liver the same as alcohol. Did you know that? So those concentrated sugars don't work. They will cloud the brain. And I'll finish this quickly. So stimulants are also depressants. Tobacco, coffee, sodas, chocolate, black tea, power drinks. These don't do well with you. They're stimulating initially, and then they lead to depression. I respect the issue of depression a lot and anxiety. We treat many people with brain chemistry distortions. First thing we do is get them all the, off all the things that trigger brain chemistry disruption. Concentrates of what has been fermented, soy sauce and vinegar. Vinegar causes proteins to rot in the stomach. Lemon or lime does fine. The last group are neurotoxic. These damage the brain. How many want a healthy brain? Especially now. Especially we've been with this so long. Healthy brain is crucial. How many brains do you have? Exactly. One. Keep it healthy. So, preservatives and additives. If you see preservatives in food, like propylene glycol, you know what that actually is? Antifreeze. It's in foods to keep foods um, squeaky. What's it called? It changes, squishy, thank you. It keeps the, the texture squishy. You find it also, however, in toothpastes and in shampoos and conditioners. So what you put on the body with skin, mouth, and hair care products and in the body, what you eat will still have an effect on the brain. You still assimilate it through the skin if it's on the body. Sodium lauryl sulfate, an industrial foaming agent, toothpaste and shampoos, uh, bromates and fluorides find in packaged foods as bromates or sodas, Fluorides in toothpaste and mouthwashes, damaging to the brain and to the thyroid. Hypothyroidism spiked after they started brominating and fluoridating foods in water. Genetically modified foods. Big problem. If you genetically modify food, what happens? It changes the structure. You eat that food and it starts to reform itself in the body with the very chemical that was used to have it resist being destroyed, like Roundup. So now our cells become Roundup factories. Is that serious? Very. Are you told about that? Never. Study. Artificial sweeteners, artificial flavors, artificial colors and dyes. I see this with kids all the time. They eat artificial foods, their nervous system goes crazy. Have you ever noticed that? A kid eats some kind of an M&M, &M, and then you... They go wacko. It's another technical term. Why? When you use a food dye on, on any substance, any food at all, it coats the protein structure, and now the enzymes of the body cannot reach that, reach that protein to break it down, and now it becomes an undigested protein, and now a trigger for autoimmunity in the body and pro-inflammatory to the brain. If it's got FD and C number anything, forget about it. Put it back on the shelf. Heavy metals and drugs obviously stay away from. So, these are the basics. We're designed to eat out of the garden. If it's not in the garden, don't do it. If it's heavily processed, stay away from it. If it's packaged on the shelf, I've been to states in, in grocery stores where there's nothing in the store I can eat. I'm not exaggerating. I travel a lot to teach. I go every two weeks all over the world for years, decades. Thank God I don't do that anymore. But we love the teaching that we do now. But I've been to places where I go to stores, there's nothing edible. I'm in awe. So how do people survive? And people are shopping, their cart's full, and my heart goes out to them. I tear my heart for them. They don't know. Who's going to teach them? Who teaches the health message? Those that live it. Who teaches the gospel? You can't teach what you don't know. You're going to share Jesus with the world. You're going to share health, share health with the world. You can't share what you don't know. How do you learn about Christ? Through his word. Through eating his word, by the way. Not just reading. Studying. Eating his word. Taking it in word by word. Contemplating, meditating upon his word so that it becomes a part of you. Every word is spoken by God in this book. It is holy. Do you know how much blood was spent to preserve this book that we can read it today? 100 million martyrs just in the Dark Ages? 
how much blood has been spilled for us today. When was this book written for, the prophecies? When were they written for? The latter days. Where are we today? We're in the latter days now. It was written for us to understand and share with the world and understand it for ourselves, that we live that life now. We want to live the life that Jesus would have us live now. How do we live that? In Christ. How do we control the appetite? In Christ. How do we heal? In Christ. That's what's being asked of us today. It's part of the sealing message. The message of righteousness by faith. The message of receiving Jesus in us today. That his life has lived in us and through us. When Christ said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. We want to say, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. I and Jesus are one. That's John 17 prayer. If Jesus prays something, will it become true? He spoke it, unquestioned. He spoke that that prayer is true in us now. It's up to us. Do we yield our will to the Lord? Are we a living temple? Do we want to defile this temple? If we do, God destroys us. Not out of animosity, but out of laws. Laws govern what consequences we have to the actions we take. We choose to worship Satan. What's our consequence? Eternal death. Does God want that for us? He wants that none should perish. He wants us all to come to him. Does he want us to be sick and ill and bad representatives of him? No, he wants us to be healthy and whole in Christ. That can only happen by being in Christ and living according to the laws that he put in place. Remember, we read at the very beginning, the Ten Commandments are as holy as his laws of health. It's up to us to live them. I pray that we do, that we can take this information in and make it part of ourselves and become that living testimony in Christ that the Lord yearns for us to be, that we can share him with the world. Pardon? Amen. Amen and amen. Now, this afternoon, we're going to do a second talk. I'm going to go into greater detail on what healing means, how we can understand it. Through Ellen White, the Lord has asked us to understand our bodies. I want to give you an understanding of how we work and why the things that we've been asked to do are being asked to do so we can heal. So let's end this talk, please, with just a moment of prayer to join me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your message of healing, and we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you want the best for us continually. I pray, Lord, that we can each be found whole in Christ. We can be found healthy in Christ. That Jesus can be in us the hope of glory. That his life may be lived through us, and we may glorify him, and the world may see him in us. All to your glory and your honor. For this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.